All right, uh, welcome to the risk working group for May 13th, 2021. We're beginning with a discussion just briefly about a White House executive order related to computer security because apparently someone hacked the main gas pipeline in the United States, if I'm recalling correctly. And, soft, and so, so part of that software bill materials, we do have that as one of our metrics. I think we've renamed it because that can be a controversial topic, but we effectively have that. Uh, Augur does generate a software bill of materials, but the topic that we've most often been discussing, I would say the last six months, is the whole that a software bill of materials does not cover, which are software dependencies and this growing ecosystem of things that we depend on and don't have total control or awareness of. And I don't know, it seems to me that that should be a big part of the order, but I don't know if there's enough awareness of that problem for it to be. Have you read far enough, Sophia? No, I, I, I it's quite long and I didn't get through it in the five okay. minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wasn't even aware of it. I was uh, writing a column for a magazine. Um, so I'll put it in the notes so others can read it when they get there. I appreciate that. Um, and if, if folks don't mind, if you feel comfortable, you can add your name uh, to the meeting notes. For those of you who don't get the Men in Black reference, <clears throat> uh, there's a scene where Will Smith tells uh, the other guy, uh, old and busted, your car, new hotness, my car. And so that's where new hotness comes from. And so the so what, what we have been talking about, so, so there are two topics. One is we've been developing, we've developed an MVP list for uh, dependency metrics. Uh, the other topic we've been working on are talk ideas for the, the upcoming OSPOCON and OSS Summit Europe in Seattle. Um, one of the things, um, Arfan, I think you've been to this group before, but I'm not sure. I see you since so many places, but since, are you new to this group? Have you been uh, risk, no, this is my third time. Okay, um, Michael, yeah. uh, what, what I like to do is just welcome new people and give you an opportunity. To, we like to give people that are new an opportunity to introduce yourself and your interest in the risk working group. Awesome. Um, Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Scavetta. Uh, I run an open source security team at Microsoft. Um, I'm also a lead one of the working groups uh, within the OpenSSF, uh, in particular, the, uh, the Identifying Security Threats Working Group. We recently released uh, a metrics dashboard around open source. And then everybody, well, not everybody, some, some folks said, you know, hey, uh, how does this, you know, intersect with chaos and what it, what is what is the uh, did we keep them separate for a reason or did you not talk? So uh, I'm here. Uh, so I'm super interested in in learning about um, the direction that you're going in terms of measuring security risk around mm -hmm. open source and uh, whether there's a cross pollination or collapse or whatever between um, between what we all do and that way we don't spend the same cycles doing the same amount of work no and david uh, i don't know if you know david wheeler D david's on my on my working group as well because so, david yeah. just david has been one of the people who has made a point of saying hey open ssf is doing some work we should definitely talk to them and i can't when are your meetings so that we get that in the i so i uh, within the next couple of days we're going to rejigger the um uh, times it's been Monday and Wednesday mornings, like every other week, but that's been confusing. So we're just going to, we're trying to find a single slot that, that works. I will get it in the notes though. Okay. Yeah, that, that would be great. I, I know I've had conflicts for some, I've got them on my calendar, but I've had conflicts. Yeah. 
Um, and so if they're moving, that is good news for me. Um, because uh, that that would be so for maybe you could tell us since David's talked a little bit about open SSF and the overlap, but maybe you could so, so the metrics that we've developed initially focused a lot on licensing and software bill of material kinds of things. And re, as it, like the last six months, we've really focused a lot on dependencies and it's been a, a rather mucky space to sort through. So from an open SSF, so for open SSF, kind of what are some of the things maybe that you're focusing on right now? So, so what we're trying to do is, so, so we're targeting a couple of different types of stakeholders and, and it's, it's really like all the stakeholders we could think of, but like the, de the developer themselves, um, an upstream developer who's consuming a dependency uh, and like actual application developers that use lots of open source. Usually, I mean, we're, we're somewhat enterprise focused there, but I think that's where the bulk of like application level development mm -hmm. kind of takes place. Um, for the for the developer themselves, um, they want to understand like how how am I doing you know on my component library you know my thing uh, from an upstream perspective the dependencies that I consume like what do I look at and then from an enterprise perspective you know I use a hundred thousand different open source components which ones should I be worrying about uh, do I need to worry about any of these and then when it really gets down to like, what am I actually measuring? Uh, we spend a lot of time going through, you know, the types of metrics that make sense and which ones are too blurry and which ones are actionable and which ones are just, um, just kind of noisy. We settled on for the initial phase of this dashboard, um, collecting existing metrics and trying to tell a story with them. So okay. uh, metrics.opensf.org is, is, the, is the website that has this all on it. It's a Grafana, you know, thing. And we, we take data from uh, three different OpenSSF projects. So David's badge program is, is one, uh, the scorecard project, which uh, is a fully automated, um, looks at a Git rep uh, GitHub repo and says- The OpenSSF like, scorecard? Yes. Yeah, and, David's mentioned that. Yeah, and then the third one is the Open SSF Project Criticality or Criticality Score Project, um, and that one is intended to to say how important is this project to the to the larger ecosystem, to the world, kind of thing. So, projects like Node and Kubernetes and things like that are just they are more important than a open source calendar widget. Um, yes, uh, and, and 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 therefore, you know. To, to be able to say, like, the, the way that I want to use information like that is uh, there's a really, really important project that's maintained by one person and hasn't had a commit in four years, and their issues are going up and their pull requests are getting stale. Right. Um, that's interesting. And, and, but I need to see that in aggregate because I have 100,000 dependencies. Right, right. I, I know, do you know Dwayne O'Brien at Indeed? I don't actually know. So, so Dwayne and I have had a number of conversations about as an as a, he's an OSPO manager. Yeah. And and his his challenge is he has eleven thousand projects that are that touch his ecosystem in one way or another, and he wants to be able to, he needs to be able to look across that ecosystem and identify the highest priorities not in right. each project but across this giant ecosystem. Yep, uh, and that's and then he also we're working on we conceived in a call yesterday uh, this idea of how do we so for example if I do a dependency analysis of, of a project and I see all these Node.js libraries that I depend on the thing I don't see is Node.js and so getting an infrastructure inventory as well as the the software inventory absolutely. Dwayne's du on the call and he can speak a little more to that high oh, shot. Oh, geez, I'm sorry, Dwayne. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's all right. Um, I, I didn't just, see just, you show up because I, 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 I was lunch. 10 minutes late. It's okay. It was just neat to hear hear me mentioned organically there. Um, the, one of the reasons for that analysis, though, is, and I think you, you hinted at this um, uh, a minute ago, like, what do we do with it once we have that information? And my interest is if I see a project that looks like it's trending in an unhealthy direction, 
I'd like to be able to mobilize money or developers to that project so that we can turn it around if it's if it's necessary, right? Um, so I, I'm I'm less interested in um, you know, hey, this this looks bad. We should get it out and and replace it with something else. I'm more interested in here's an opportunity for us to have an impact on something we really use. Absolutely, yeah. So, so the, the, the whole like kind of direction that we're going, we really wanted to get something out because we've been talking about it for about a year um, and we were getting just really tired of just talking and not like doing. Um, mm -hmm. So we got, so we got the, the, we'll call it an MVP out. Um, but now, now we're going back and looking at the actual metrics to see like, does this metric like really make sense? And, you know, is, is the, just, just the fact that you run static analysis, like, is that the thing that we should be measuring or is it like, are you fixing the things that you found or how do, how do those weight together? What I would love to get is an SSL labs, a plus score, you know, through, through F. Um, and I and totally recognize I, that there are, there are like, I don't know what that is. Oh, sorry. Uh, if, if you go to SSL, so, so um, uh, it's just a letter grade, uh, give everybody okay, a letter okay. grade that that's really big. And it's like all things being equal, a plus is better than a C. So if, you know, um, it, because the, the problem with a lot of dashboards that I've seen about this, I think CNCF, CNCF um, has, has dashboards about uh, on their projects. And it is so much data that I, 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 I can look at all the data and I don't know what to pull out of it. To, I don't know if it's good or bad or, or, or you know, if, or if it's just data. Um, so I think we need to condense things down to um, like, how is it overall? Uh, and then you can make right. decisions what to, do with, what to do with that. But we're not there yet. Um, and I, I'm also super conscious of kind of uh, having like large enterprises come in and tell open source developers how awful their thing is. Um, <laughs> and like just the messaging there, because that's not what it, that's not what I want to do. And that's not what it's about. Um, uh, so there's, yeah, there's challenges all over. Hey, overall, are you talking about, say, all scores across all projects in an, an ecosystem or in a category? So you can say your project is X percent low or higher than similar kinds of projects that all have difficulties in making those kinds of yeah. distinctions and categories, but like some way to baseline yourself. Yeah, so, so, so we haven't, so we've talked a lot about, so, so in, it, it came up in the context of like, I want to use a crypto library and I'm uh, on a Python stack. Here are my four options. And this one option is significantly better than the other three. Like that, that's interesting. Um, I don't know how to do that without like manually curating it or having it be really kind of sloppy. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I think that would provide a lot of value to the community. Um, at the same time, I don't want, I, I don't, I want to be careful about how objective that is because I don't want to be like, picking winners and losers out there, um, you know, unless I can, I mean, unless I feel really good about the, the objectivity of, of the metrics that we, that we show. Even just having the list and saying, we're not, we're not even, mm -hmm. this kind of goes against the A plus score, but like, like here are your, here are your five libraries and here was the last time each of them were updated. And here's when, you know, the, the, the three of them use static analysis, the other one doesn't. Um, I think that would be interesting too, as a maybe as a starting point. Um, is the is I found the GitHub repository for your open SSF metric, metrics hmm. org. Is that where the actual dashboard is being developed and then will be deployed? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so so the the, the content there, um, the, the the project itself, there's a like a Django front end thing, which is like the front page that you see, sure. and then once you go into it, it's Grafana. The dashboard config is still just in grafana we need to like somehow get that into a into github it'll yeah, just get that over time. i just advise, I advise strongly against javascript <laughs> if you um, want a dashboard that is expensive to maintain build it in some javascript framework and and we, we started <laughs> out the process of like let's just do it ourselves, and and then we got so into like this isn't the business we want to be in so we're like just grafana it and and we're done and that worked a lot better. Yeah, one of the, one of the things that chaos has sort of held as a value over time is we we generate the metrics, we we help provide 
consistent definitions and tools that make them concrete and useful for people. But we don't score them for for people because every I think security is a little bit different. But in general, we let each organization apply the metrics and rank and, and prioritize mm -hmm. things for their own purposes. Yep. Uh, so, you know, shutting down the main gas supply on the East Coast, that seems like there's probably a single dashboard that would give that an A or an F. <laughs> <laughs> So, so there, I think I, I recognize security may have a slight, understandably, a slightly different value system um, around it. So, but but, um, but but even there, rational people could disagree on exactly how to weight things and, you know, all that. So, yeah. Have Have you heard of Open Mind? Open M I N E D. The, re the reason I bring it up, uh, yeah. it's but a guy named Andrew Tragic, I think. And, and the idea is it's a wrapper that allows you to either go all in and be open about the things that you're doing or to maintain privacy with your identity. And the application, and I was talking with Remy DeCosmaker about this actually yesterday as well. The advantage of this for is some of the security applications is you can have people going and doing um, kind of white hatty sort of things without or, or disclosing things privately or in private groups without disclose you know so there's this security infrastructure where we don't like to broadcast the big issues until they're closed mm -hmm. and so this is a an emerging technology for identity that may have some utility in in the identification of bugs and the ability of people to share them mm. um so that's I'll just throw that throw that out with. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I'll, I can send. I'll send you a link on that. It's in. It's in my rather uh, scribbledy notes. <laughs> and so, so I had a little trouble even reading them. Um, so it sounds like the, it sounds like the actually dependencies are a significant component of the work that you're doing in Open SSS. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean. I, I mean. Uh, D different work groups are approaching things differently. I, I think dependencies themselves impact the, the top level thing just the same as the top level dependencies. So right. um, yeah, I don't think we've ever like consciously made the decision to include or exclude them. We just always assume that they were there. Right, uh, right. Yeah. And I think, I think in, um, in the four or five years of chaos, we, we've gone from the challenge of open source itself growing at a rapid pace and needing scaling metrics to I think in the last 18 months, de dependency issues have become incredibly visible. Yeah, uh, definitely. In, in the community. And, and so hence our turn in that direction. And maybe one of the things, uh, Sophia, where should we go from here? Should we talk a little bit about some of our MVPs or should or maybe Sophia Duane, I'm, I'm looking at some of the people who kind of have guided these discussions. Should we talk? about some of these MVPs a little bit or because one of the I think one of the things we have here is our our OSPOCon and OSSEU talk discussion but I think that kind of takes a back seat at, at this moment um, and maybe maybe we talk about uh, our MVP kinds of things uh, Sophia Duane what do you think Arfan do you have a view Not really, sorry. It's all right, I'll facilitate. I'm, right. I'm, I, I've been out for a couple of sessions. I, I'd be more interested in hearing Sophia's input or someone else who's been here a little more regularly. Mm -hmm. So I think Sophia stepped away. So I'll just take us to the, so we went through a rather long discussion um, and let me bounce around a little bit here to these talks, but, but one of, one of the discussions that we've had is there are so many different types of dependencies and ways that they're architected. And so one of the talks um, that Dhruv, who is, I don't think he's, uh, Dhruv's on the call. So this is from Dhruv's Google Summer of Code project, which I cannot speak of until May 17th regarding what's happening with it. I will say that we have uh, three students working on risk areas uh, in the Google Summer of Code for Augur. 
and chaos. Um, but there's direct dependencies, transitive dependencies, and interdependent dependencies, circular dependencies. These are the basic four categories that we've kind of identified. It took us quite a while uh, to get to these. So I'm, I'm interested when we think about things like the work that, that, that you're doing um, at Microsoft or GitHub or wherever other companies, um, when you put together the dashboard, when you think about how to communicate dependencies, do all of these types of dependencies come to the forefront in different ways? Or is the work presently focused on a particular type of dependency? And, and I'm asking that yeah. question only to frame how I think about OpenSSF and the work that we're doing and the, the muck that we've trudged through to get to this mm -hmm. almost elegant summary. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's 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 a hard one. I think the the so I'll I'll speak both as Microsoft and OpenSSL on, on, on the Microsoft side. Um, the way we met, we, we flattened the dependency list. To, to, okay. To so so we just have a giant list of here's everything. Um, you have a vulnerability in it. You got to do something about it. Mm -hmm. That's hard because if you have the vulnerability in dependency C down there uh, in the in the transitive list and A is up to date, well, what right. do you do about it? Um, it, it puts everybody in a, in a kind of an awkward spot. Um, there's, there's risk, there, there's danger in whatever you do at that point. Right. Um, the, uh, on the open SSF side, um, at least as far as the metrics go, we would just score them all separately. Uh, mm -hmm. And then as you evaluate your entire transitive closure, you see that you're using C and it has a vulnerability and, or, or is unmaintained or, or whatever. And, and you, do whatever you want at that point with that information. The, the thing that's missing is, um, and, and, and this is, I, I don't know that there's um, a lot of rigor here yet, um, but- Probably as, not. Yeah, but, but like, as you, as you go through these things, no, I'm sorry, I didn't mean, I didn't mean in, in your paper. I just no, no, like, I, in, I, in, I, in, I think in general, yeah. I mean, because we're still sorting this out, so yeah. there can't be rigor yet. Right. So, so like, you know, uh, uh, if you go up to the inter interdependency one, um, a, a this one, uh, the... start, no, we'll, we'll, one more up. So vulnerability in A uh, yeah. has some likelihood of impact on the project. Right. A, a vulnerability in C on average will have less likelihood of impact on the project because just the nature of dependencies, like you don't use the entire thing. Right. Um, you use a subset of it and just on average, it'll be less over time. So if you have a fourth level dependency, the, the likelihood that it will have any impact is low. I don't know how to quantify that. And I don't right. know, how, I don't, I, I, th that's a gut feel. Um, however, we've, we've done some research in uh, analyzing control flow as it goes from a project through its dependencies. And what we found, particularly in the NPM ecosystem, is there are, well, if, if you know the NPM ecosystem, this should be obvious, oh, but like, I, yes, I you, know you just I include it. everything <laughs> and then it includes everything. So you have these oh, yeah. enormous transitive closures where you really only need this like little tiny thread of execution through it. So um, it, it, it's, yeah. it's um, and, and the problem is when you tell people to like, even if, even if it was actionable to like go and upgrade this thing, they're wasting their time because it has no impact on the final thing. So how do you like reprioritize and like risk score vulnerabilities based off of where they sit in the transitive closure? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that would be a terrific exactly. project for someone to that, that solve. Sophia, you look like you have a thought or you're reading the White House report. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I had to step away for a bit. So I'm kind of like coming into this conversation okay. and I missed a bit. But I'm just thinking about in practice when I've done similar work, I was looking at what kinds of files were referencing things and transitive dependencies. And then using my own contextual knowledge to know what was more or less important. So it wasn't, I didn't have a great 
systematic way of doing it was more like, oh, this is an experimental project. It's fine. <laughs> Whereas, right. Yeah. Or like even nested in the sub project, like this is seeing what things are calling it and when it, it's not everything is crucial to the thing running in production. It could be a test file. Um, and sometimes depending on your folder structure, you can see that in the title of the folder. Other times you just need to understand the thing you're working with. So I agree that there's definitely a variety and importance and or risk level to a project depending in the, within the dependencies. And I, I don't quite know how to do that systematically because I think it is highly contextual. Yeah, I, I can, I can, I can't speak to risk per se, but I can say in my own experience with NPM is the dependency tree affects me not from a vulnerability perspective as deeply as it does from a when one thing changes and it, a lot of other things are dependent on it, it breaks everything. Mm -hmm. um, that's the that's the challenge with dependencies that I face more often than security vulnerabilities, honestly with NPM, with, with these, then it's more of the circular dependencies and the, these networks of things that depend on all the same, yeah, that, that kind of thing. Uh, but I, I think, um, Sean, you asked what GitHub does with its dependency graph. Um, was that, yeah. Was that, yeah, so. Yeah, uh, great, GitHub could... shows that I have far more dependencies than I ever realized. <laughs> right, so <laughs> it I think. It terrifies me how much, <laughs> how many dependencies yeah, my, I have. My, my understanding is, um, like, and if this could be wrong, so like, let's just pretend I'm right for a second is, you know, you have the direct dependencies that we see um, mm -hmm. that you've expressed in like a lock file or something. And then, and then we do have, you know, the dependency graph does have your transitive dependencies as well. So we do kind mm -hmm. of recursively, exhaustively kind of go through that, mm -hmm. through that stack. And obviously that changes as you evolve, but I don't think we try and do anything clever on the, you have now this kind of cross-linked dependency in your stack. I don't think we try and do anything with that. Um, I, I think the uh, graphing problem is far more difficult. Yeah, um, and I know that, um, and the, I, I know that um, there are folks looking at how um, how we can be sure that you're actually even calling a dependency because you might have expressed it as a dependency, but is it actually used? Um, I think there's a reasonable number of projects that have a dependency where they're never actually using it. So, yeah. um, and that's a thing that requires sort of knowledge of the sort of yeah. um, the, the, the library and now to kind of represent that. So I know, I actually think that it, it, I, th I think I might have to bring somebody along from GitHub who actually works on some of these engineering features uh, at some point, because I think he, I, I, I know who I'm thinking of, a guy called Doug Krieger, who I think would really enjoy like giving you like an overview of what GitHub does under the hood, if that would be interesting. Um, that would be but, phenomenally interesting. Yeah. He, yeah, and I, the reason I think he might turn up is like he reads the literature and stuff, because like a lot of what they're doing is fairly cutting edge. Um, yeah, I imagine stuff. So, like, you know, some engineers don't want to come and talk to a, a group of people like this, and that's because yeah. academic work is sometimes a little hard to know how to enter into that world. Although this is pretty applied, actually. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think. I, and I think this we're not crazy is, academics in this group. Yeah. We're like people solving real problems. <laughs> yeah, I think I think nearly everyone on this call is touching tools and-, and Yeah, exactly, exactly. So for me, it, it, like, as you said, like I've reduced the dependencies in Augur by 80% over the last six months, simply by determining what we're not using anymore <laughs> um, and taking them out of our setup.py and our package lock.json. So, I mean, there are things that end up being listed as dependencies that are no longer dependencies it's just that nobody went and took that out um for sure that that happens um so, so uh, did you real quick, so something else that i've noticed which is uh in my opinion definitely an anti-pattern but if, if you look at in the transit of dependencies you know imagine our project at the bottom mm -hmm. doing a you know requires or import or whatever the language on dependency C directly. Um, I, 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 I didn't think that condition, I, I would have thought that would have be, been considered a bug and something like really avoided, but I'm seeing it a lot recently as, as I started looking for it. So this is, I take a dependency on something at a top level, 
but I directly reference one of its subdependencies without making that subdependency like without explicitly like require like uh, adding to my package. You know, I, I can I can actually tell you why that happens sometimes. Please, because I because I've, cause I've, I've done it myself temporarily. Um, I had six Google Summer of students, code students working on machine learning stuff, and many of them used TensorFlow and uh, SciPy and another kind of scikit-learn. And you can't have multiple different versions of that in a package. And so in order to standardize the version, I would put it in the setup.py at the core of the project. And then all the pieces of the project that use it, I would know are on the same version. So I'm declaring dependencies on, it's on my project, but really my project is a collection of workers that are their own projects and have their own dependencies. Yeah. And I'm declaring them in the main project so that I'm certain they're the same version right. in all of the pieces and all the modules that I plug in. Yeah. Um, and, the, and eventually I go back and I, I undo that, but to get it going, like to make it run, that's that's why that happened right like it was just easier for me to do it that way than to go through six different plugins yeah. and, and and sort them all out individually yep makes sense um it also gives me a, a higher level view of what all my dependencies are because mm -hmm. when they're scattered about different modules so that's why people do dumb things <laughs> yeah <laughs> It was, it was just more, more, more surprising to me. And, and it came up with uh, React Scripts, I think does that. And I think D3 as well. So these are big projects that yeah, it's just easier, I guess. It, it's a convenience thing, but it does kind of hide that like uh, abstraction layer. Yeah, it's the version consistency, I think, yeah. that drives people to do it more than anything else. Yeah. Um, just if you can solve that problem, you're my hero. Um, <laughs> I think uh, with the uh, point Michael pointed out, like my our project directly depend on C is uh, truly captured in the last uh, second image interdependent dependency where our project depend on A and B and A again depends on B, which is like truly captured in that thought. Yep. So Vinod, you're basically suggesting we could also add an error in this graphic. I'm sorry, an arrow that points from A to B. So uh, so, so in this, uh, like, if, if you look at the transitive, we have our project depending on A, our project depending on C. Uh, A is depending on C, but there is a scenario, our project is depending on A and on C both, which is captured in the next graph. I see. So this so is our the... project. Yeah, interdependent and, dependencies where these are darn near yes. circular, but not quite. Yeah, so like our project is depending on A, our project is depending on B, whereas A on which I'm depending is also depending on B. So there is a loop going on in that thing. There, there indeed is. Which is now, I think, bring me back to the context discussion, because I think it's for individual in de dependencies, it'll be hard to know the full context, but if things are recurring in any sort of overlapping graph, then that should be, should have a greater weight or greater interest because um, it assumes that it'll muck up things more or be less contained um, if something were to go down. Yeah. And, and I think it's the like the reason I think GitHub has a nice enumeration of dependencies and in, in a kind of a tree format is because once you start to do the graph, it gets exponentially more complicated to, to navigate. I think David Wheeler's terrifying spider graph that he shared with us like three months ago is really just burned in my brain. Yeah, yeah, yes, it, it is in mine. As, many things David Wheeler has shared with us are have terrified me and are burned in my brain. I mean, it's fascinating, but it's just- like... I, I love David, it, it's, <laughs> but he, he knows too much. I mean, if this were a, if this were a criminal enterprise, some, he'd be killed because he just simply knows too much. Um, I, I, just to, I, I think 
this is great. I want to under I want to understand a lot more about what is going to be represented in the um, BP for um, OSS OSF. What was it, Michael? Open Open SSF. O, Open SSF. Thank you. Sorry <laughs> that there's there's a lot of acronyms in open source software and it's, it's TLA's. I, I've ever, yes, I have I have a limited capacity. I'm I'm curious. Uh, th these are the as at the conclusion of our wading through the muck, we identified a collection of what we think are useful minimum viable product metrics, things that we plan to develop before the next next metrics release. Um, so uh, these include in, just enumerating the dependencies. So obviously there are tools that do that. Chaos would create a metric that defines what that means. Um, the objectives that basically we follow a goal question metric format when we build a metric. So what's the goal? Understanding your dependencies, the objective is to list them. Um, and then the metric is some kind of enumeration. Also some kind of uh, evaluation of sustainability risk. So this could include issue closers, number of committers, core stability. Um, uh, third one is, and I, I guess I'm just reading these to you just to give you some mm -hmm. context. The dependency range, like how many times a single dependency is referenced. So uh, Dwayne talks about, you know, I've got this, re I've got this dependency referenced in like 14 different places, but is it actually used in that many different places and how much of it is used? So the, that's part of it. I don't know if you're probably familiar with Libyers if you know David. David, David, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things Dwayne and I talked about is that that um, base, essentially uh, on another tab, we've identified a number of tools that identify dependencies in a number of different languages. And so one of the things that we're going to try, you know, pilot or give it a shot is collecting all of these different tools and having some kind of wrapping tool that you can apply to any repository and show dependencies, basically calling these other tools as Python wrapped modules. Um, it's very hacky. It's like a car on blocks in your front yard. And so if Microsoft's working on something better, love to hear about it. Um, yep. You have to say so now. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll point you, I'll, I'll add this into the, into the notes. Um, we have an open source project called OSS Gadget that we built to kind of scratch our own itch around like, get, I, I want the, the content for the NPM module foo or the Python module this or clone mm -hmm. this GitHub. Or, 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 but I wanted, but I didn't want to have to remember like where to go to actually get the bits. So right. it does that, it does uh, health. It looks for like crypto, there's like eight or 10 different modules in it. Uh, one of them is metadata. So yeah. it, like similar to like libraries of IO, it'll fetch the metadata and normalize it and give it Did to you, you back. Nope. I've made I'll, such a mess of the minutes. Did you paste it in the minutes? I will do it. Uh, <laughs> okay. Third one under uh, under OpenSSL. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah since, since I'm uh, not following any order at all. So good. Um. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, uh, I, I mean, in, in terms of enumerating the dependencies, the other problem you're going to have there is um, the dependencies are in in some cases, and I don't know how trivial this is, um, uh, only really known at runtime. Like you can't mm -hmm. actually introspect like a manifest file and be sure exactly what you're gonna get. Right. Um, and because different versions can have like wildly different chains past them. Um, and if you know, you know, David, you probably know Kate Stewart. Maybe not. Kate's, no, uh, Kate's the uh, program manager for the Zephyr project. Which is oh, okay. the and and so her she is very concerned about the distinction between dependency dependencies in development and dependencies at runtime because obviously yeah. for her and safety critical systems runtime dependencies are where it's all at yep and that is a separate kind of understanding um, so excellent yeah point there I I think we don't have runtime metrics here simply because Kate is the master of that and the rest of us feel like we don't know it. At least I feel like I don't know very much about how to identify them distinctly. Um, 
Um, and then, uh, hey, look, OSF scorecard. There you go. Uh, is is one it's basically reverse engineering that into a metric or a collection of metrics because mm -hmm. it, we've talked about it a lot it, it's obviously a very good tool uh, and then finally uh, some kind of matrix it occasionally comes up since we opened with security why not close with security that there is this relationship between dependencies and vulnerabilities and understanding not only the dependencies in a project, but what are the known vulnerabilities? And the OSS scorecard, I'm sure, addresses that in some way. Um, we've talked about how sketchy and cobbled together the the record of what known dependencies are. Like it's, I guess, this federated kind of system that used to run out of Gaithersburg, Maryland, the um, standards body there. I can't remember the name of it. Nest. NIST, thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so there's there's been varying degrees of, you know, people even knowing how to get a vulnerability number. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and I, I think GitHub is helping a lot there in, in their, their role as a CNA. Um, I, I would, um, and I'm sorry, I feel like I'm talking a lot. I, did, I, You're, just, well, came, you, you, I just came to listen, but-, um, but, uh, but <laughs> look at look at all the knowledge we're extracting from you. I, you know, I, we're using I'm, you and I'm proud I'm, of it. Happy to know. <laughs> um, the difference between like CVEs uh, and mm -hmm. vulnerabilities. Um, right. You know, it, CVEs are like a small subset. Um, right. And the problem that we have is it's really easy to find like tooling results. It's really difficult to turn those into like confirmed vulnerabilities. And difficult meaning like expensive because we need people to do it. Right. Um, and, but so, so at the same time, the vast majority of open source projects have never been scanned like by anything. Um, right. And are not, you know, not, not that secure. Um, Node, Node does a really good job of telling me about all of my vulnerabilities every time yes. I compile it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Yep, but, but and that takes a lot of work by by uh, you know, by people. Somebody, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, to I, so these are the things we thought of as MVPs for the dashboard you're putting together. Mm -hmm. What's not here? Uh, I mean, if you if you just go to, I mean, you, I, you know, I I think you can I open live demo if you want, but but I think I do open SSF. Yeah, so at some at one point in time I had it open, but oh, I maybe. hope it's not that five hundred error. That no, 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 no. <laughs> oh, metrics uh, uh, OpenSSF.org. Eventually, I will remember that. That's all good, and you can just click on like Kubernetes, Kubernetes, because that, that's a good. Um, Where do uh, I click on in, it? In the third paragraph, the second to last link. Uh, okay. Yeah. There we go. Um, so this is, this is the Grafana thing, and and um, looks like DevStats.io a little bit, but but prettier yeah, I think, and I think with, with, with fewer all... graphs. Exactly. Um, so stars releases age dependence. Best practices badge. Yep. Uh, and, and this is the scorecard. Scorecard stuff, yeah. So we're going to add more, you know, more widgets into each of those and fix some of the colors and things like that. But um, we we have a we have a tool that builds uh, that uses the phosology scanners to identify mm -hmm. s bombs. Yes. Um, that kind of stands alone. If, but you can probably use phosology itself um, to get yeah. that. But if you're, I mean, if, if you're less familiar with license scanning kinds of things um, or software bill of material enumeration kinds of things, let me know. And I've got a couple things that we do with Augur. Cool. That I'm, not, I'm not saying use Augur because I think it's, yeah. I, think, I think there's pieces that we've learned that yeah. are useful in this context. It's yeah. a bit bloated for this purpose. Well, the nice thing is, so so like each of the three, so criticality badge program and the the scorecard, these are all things that I literally consume a giant JSON file or yeah. a bunch of JSON files, dump it, flatten it, throw it into a database, and then the dashboard is driven from the database. 
So running Fossology or Augur or whatever separately, ex, you know, churning out kind of an export that can be imported um, keeps things as, kind of architecturally nice. Yeah, yeah, we just de at, we import the JSON Python file and dump it. Yeah. Yeah, this looks, this is a really, this is a really good start. I mean, achieved it. I like that uh, the date that it was achieved is there. Yeah. It's, it's, um, so oh, open SSF best practices is different than the CII best practices badge that David No, it, sorry, it's actually identical. Um, because CII as an organization is, um, I think it's gone entirely. Um, oh. All of the work kind of rolled I, into, the, into OpenSSF. I probably need to rebrand the CIA best practices badge text on Augur then. <laughs> yeah, I mean, literally, I mean, literally the badge program is still at like bestpractices.coreinfrastructure.org. Yeah. You know, URLs are hard to change. Okay, this is, this is really, yeah. this is great. I, so I have one question and then, but we're out of time technically. How can it be passing if there's red X's or question marks? That's, that's a great question. And that is actually because I don't make a um, uh, judgment on what passing means. Passing is whatever the badge program told me was passing. So okay. if you go to the, if it, 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 there's literally a field that just says passing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, maybe there's, and I, Augur is certified, but I want, there's, you know, there's a long form you go through and there's some things that can be automatically checked. And so, I think there are some things that are not a hundred percent required. So, so if you go up to the, to the, just scroll up just a little bit mm -hmm. and where you see package GitHub Kubernetes Kubernetes, if you just click on that and type Augur, uh, you should, it should be there. So package. Uh, oh, you, you, it's a full text, so you can just type auger. Oh, yeah. auger. I'm going to type chaos auger because there's a blockchain project called yeah. auger. I can yeah. see. So then just select that top link. Yeah. All right. There you go. That's that's the data we have. Whoa. For you. Whoa. So my criticality score. What does criticality mean? Oh, how uh, important it is? Importance to the overall universe. Okay. All right. Well, so 59 percent's not bad. We're passing dynamic analysis. We're, we're failing on some of the same things Kubernetes is. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I think Zephyr, if you go, um, uh, Zephyr is like one of the super achievers. And then I'll end the meeting. Uh, what? Oh, okay. No, no, Zephyr. Sorry, uh, just, just start typing Zephyr and then just select it in the drop down. Um, Thank you. The Zephyr Project Dash RTOS. I always forget that. But yeah, they're gold. They, they have, see, they have all the green marks. Zephyr is like a super overachiever on the badging program. Yeah. Um, yeah. But still, even there, you can see on the bottom, they don't sign their releases and, you know, it, or, or at least, yeah. and this is the scorecard project was not able to automatically identify that they are signing their releases. Yeah. They, cool. they have, over 70 different licenses in, in that yeah. project. And, and I think that's largely a byproduct of all the different device manufacturers that are contributing. Yeah. Um, they, they do, that is a challenge they face for yeah. sure. Um, well, Michael, uh, Arfon, thank you for joining us. Dwayne, good to see you again. Uh, everybody, Sophia, Elizabeth, Nod, um, excellent discussion. I really, I learned a ton today, which uh, and we got none of the agenda done. So I feel like a successful, <laughs> a successful meeting or, uh, facilitator because I, I ignored the agenda in favor of what people found more interesting. Um, and any, any final words or just- When's help? the uh, OspoCon deadline? Uh, it is June 13th, same as OSS Summit oh. Europe. We got one away. more meeting to flesh out what we want to submit. Cool. Uh, yeah, I, we've got two I, more meetings. Like, uh, okay, barely, probably one is. Re we should really spend some time on it at the next meeting. And um, it, I do encourage folks to take a look. Vinod did a ton of work um, putting together some summaries of the ideas, and um, so I will just uh, encourage 
everyone to maybe take a look at that if you have a chance um, prior to the next meeting. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. I'm going to go now find out about our government's concerns about cybersecurity emerging. <laughs> Good idea. Take care. Bye. Take care.